Amen. Well, one day we will be on the banks of the promised land. And what a day that will be when we finally see Jesus face to face. Take your Bible this morning, turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter chapter number 4. And when you get there, I want to preach, uh, I want to begin reading in just a moment from verse number 12. 1 Peter chapter number 4 and verse number 12. I want to encourage you to do just like you would in here. Get your Bible out and your notebook and take notes if you want to. Jot some things down that speak to you as we, uh, as we preach this morning. I want to preach on uh, this subject from 1 Peter chapter number 4 and verse number 12. Truths about trials. I, I want to preach on this subject. Truths about trials trials. First Peter is a wonderful book that is written, of course, by the Apostle Peter to believers who were scattered abroad throughout the known world during this time. So I thought it would be such an appropriate passage to read from this morning because really, instead of being the church gathered here in this building this morning like we normally would, we are the church that is scattered and so 1 Peter is actually an applicable book, for, applicable book for us for the situation and the time in which we find ourselves. But more specifically than that, it is written to Christians not only who are scattered, but Christians who are experiencing extreme persecution. In fact, a certain event happened in the first century A.D. around the year 64. The entire city of Rome in Italy became engulfed in the Roman Empire with a great fire. A very large portion of the city was burned to the ground. The emperor at that time was a man whose name was Nero, and he was a particularly deranged man. He was mentally ill by all historical accounts. He was a deranged man who was regarded as one of history's most ruthless rulers. Most people believe that Nero was the one who was responsible for starting the fire, but he needed someone to blame, and so he found a group that everybody loved to hate in those days. And it was at this time a smaller sect of believers that we call now today Christians. This event set off some of the greatest persecution against any group of people in the entire history of the world. In fact, the Roman historian Tacitus tells us that in this day, Nero would take Christians, he would cover them in wild skins, and he would throw them in pits with wild animals. And just for the sheer entertainment of he and his friends, they would watch as these Christians were devoured and eaten alive. Nero would in his palace have parties at nighttime. And rather than lighting a traditional torch or a candle, he would take the Christians, roll them in pitch, hang them up by their feet, light them on fire, and use them as illumination for his parties. They said that Nero would sit and listen to the screams for pleasure and enjoyment. Early Christians were people who were well acquainted with grief. They were well acquainted with sorrow. They were well acquainted with persecution. They were well acquainted with trials. I was taught as a kid, whenever you think it bad, always remember there's somebody who's got it worse than you. It's hard to find somebody that had it worse than these early Christians. And, and yet, Peter reminds them through their trials, Peter reminds them through their difficulties, he says to them, believers, understand this, that every trial that comes upon you is going to be used by God for a purpose in your life, and it will ultimately good, be used for His glory. Everything is used to the glory of God. Not only that, but it will also be used for your good. And so I want to say something to you this morning. We're in a very difficult time. We're in a strange time. We're in a perilous time, you might even say. But I want you to know something, that God still uses all things just as He did in Bible times for His glory and for the good of His people. Now, I realize that life is not static. See, just because we're experiencing this trial of a virus through our world does not mean that people are not still facing all kinds of trials and tribulations of another kind. 
Some people are infected with the virus. Others are still fighting cancer. Others are dealing with heart issues. Other, others are dealing with dementia. All kinds of various things. See, life is, is not static. Everything in the world doesn't stop for a virus. But we have a virus plus everything else we were dealing with. And I know that I'm probably speaking to many people this morning who are walking through trials. Can I tell you something this morning? That there is a word from the word for you today. And I want to give you some things that I believe will help you from 1 Peter chapter number 4. Let's begin reading in verse number 12. The Bible says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, He is blasphemed, but on your part, He is glorified. Father, help us to preach this morning with Holy Spirit conviction and anointing. God, help me to do through this time what I cannot do in my own strength and in my own power, but what I can do if you'll give me unction and anointing and a touch from on high. God, I pray that you would speak through me now to whoever might be listening, and that your word would, as it was promised to us, not return void. Pray that you would let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, my strength and my Redeemer. I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody at home said with me, Amen. Let me give you three things from this passage of Scripture that I think will help you to understand some truths about trials. Number one, I believe you can find from verse number 12 that there is the reality of trials. There is the reality of trials. Peter is quick to point out a very simple truth to us in this passage. And that truth is this. Christians should expect to encounter trials. There are many people, many preachers, who will teach you that trials are a result of our attitude and our state of mind. They will tell us if only we could think right, if only we could speak right, then we would be able to drive away the trials from our life. But I want you to notice the word that Peter uses when he's speaking to these believers. He says, beloved. It means he's speaking to believers. Speaking to those people who are in the covenant family of God. That word, agapetos in the Greek, speaks of Christians united in their faith. He's talking about the children of God here. Peter's purpose for writing this section was to let believers know that sufferings do not indicate that God has abandoned you. No, in fact, it tells you something just the opposite. 2 Timothy 3.12 reminds us, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will not may, not could, not might, but all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So the more godly I try to be, the more I can expect that persecution and trials will come. One preacher said this way, I never had so many problems till I got saved. See, before I was saved, I sinned and I lived according to my own ways and I did what I wanted to do and I never had a thought about it. But when the Holy Spirit came to live inside of me, He gave me a different perspective, a different vision, a different conviction, a different course of living. And now, I feel conviction when I don't live according to the ways of God. I experience trials that I otherwise would not have tried, would not have experienced. Let me tell you something, the devil loves nothing more than an apathetic Christian. The devil loves, more than an ap loves nothing more than an apathetic church. People are saying today, well, the devil's happy he's closed the doors. I'll tell you what I believe. I believe the devil's terrified. I believe the devil is terrified because he believes that he has awoken a church in America and perhaps in other parts of the world that for a long time has been asleep. 
But I think God is waking us up through this trial and He is showing us that He wants to do something through us but He's going to have to shake us to our core to get us to wake up and see that we can't do church like we've always done church. We, it cannot just be business as usual. And you say, preacher, what in God's name could He do to get our attention? I'll tell you what He could do. He could close us up for a couple of months. He could make some people listening to me remember how much they desire fellowship with the community of faith. They could make pastors and preachers remember how much and how blessed we are to have the calling that we stand in. I really believe with all of my heart. I don't think the devil has gained another inch. In fact, I think he's lost territory. I think God is moving in his people. I think God is moving in his church. And I think God is moving in this country to shake us up and bring revival. That's what I believe. Now, I don't know. I I may be wrong, but I'm telling you, I think God is doing a new thing. I believe that Isaiah 64 is is happening, that we are seeing the Lord open up the heavens and literally come down among His people and work in a way that we've not seen in a long time. We, We may just see a great awakening in this country. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You suffer times of, of, of suffering. It does not mean that God has left you. In fact, Paul said this to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 3. He says, listen, believers, you, you know that we were appointed for this. Well, appointed for what, Paul? He said, well, we told you, in fact, before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation. Just as it happened. And you know, Peter paints for us a picture of believers standing together in tribulation and persecution. How do we stand together? We apply 1 Peter 5, 9. Resist him. Who's that? The devil. Stand fast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. What is Peter saying there? He's, He's saying, resist the urge to throw yourself a pity party. Oh, preacher, isn't that what we love to do? Oh, why me? I mean, Lord, I know so many other people who are just living however they want to live. They're not living for you. They don't got one thought or concern about what they ought to be doing for you. And Lord, here I am trying to serve you, and now you've given me this trial. I mean, we're all guilty. We would just, if we were all honest, we'd be just straight up and say, you know, preacher, I love nothing more than a good pity party. Peter says, resist that urge. And rest assured that even in your suffering and your trials... God is still with you. Notice the word that Peter uses to describe them. He calls them fiery trials. It's a Greek word there is purosis. Almost sounds like purify, doesn't it? Or purity. See, the the phrase there, fiery trials, is defined as trials which purify the faith in the hearts of Christians. See, I know you love the mountain. And I know I love the mountain, and I know all believers love the mountain. But you actually learn a lot more in the valley, and you learn a lot more in the trial, and you learn a lot more in the storm than you'll ever learn on the mountain. And so you need fiery trials to test you. You need fiery trials to put you in a place where you got to determine, do I believe God Or do I not? We understand that God's not up in heaven just randomly picking people. Well, I want to give this person a trial. I want to give this person a little test. I want to give this person some suffering. No, no. God is very specific in the way that he works. 1 Peter 1, 7 says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, God's got something waiting for you that is far greater than anything you can imagine, but you're not going to get it without proving yourself a little bit. I mean, don't we want instant gratification? That's why we love fast food, because we can pull up to the window and we can get it handed to us in 30 seconds. We want it right now, right here on the spot. But God doesn't work that way. God has something wonderful for you, believer, but He's going to test you, and He's going to try you, and He's going to put you in the fire before you receive that which he has prepared for you. See, our trials are not to hurt us. They're actually to make us all that we can be for God. Peter uses this imagery here of precious metal that is going through the process of of purification. 
If you've ever looked up the process of smelting, and I'm by, by, by no means an expert, but I know that you take a, 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 when you go out and you mine for precious metals, you take them out and, and you get the precious metal out of wherever you might be mining. But when you take the precious metals out, you also bring a whole lot of impurities with it as well. And so you have to put it under heat. And what the heat does is the heat separates that which you do not want because it is impure from that which you do want because it is precious. And see, when God puts you through a trial, He's putting you under heat. And what He's actually doing is He is taking you and He's putting you under the heat so that that which is precious might remain and stand apart. And that which is impure and that which is of this world and that which is not of God might be separated out and cast to the side. So literally, your trials are for the purpose of getting rid of you and getting you full of Jesus. David said in Psalm 66, 10, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. Peter just comes right out and says that. He says, believer, this, this trial is to test you. The word test or try there is defined as putting one's character to the test. See, trials, listen to me now, trials reveal the sincerity of your devotion to Jesus Christ. See, it is very easy to serve Him when everything is right. But in the trials, we really learn just how much we truly love Jesus. And we learn just how much we really meant all those things that we said to Him when everything in our life was right. It's easy to walk the walk when everything in life is going exactly as you planned. How do we react in moments of suffering and testing? Peter reminds us that trials are just a reality in the life of the believer. But then let me give you a second thing. Not only is there the reality of trials, but in verse 13 there is the response to trials. There is the response to trials. See, even when we come face to face with the reality that there will be trials in our life, we also have to examine the proper response that we give to these trials. Notice the very first word that Peter says in verse number 13. Believer, verse 12, this... Don't think it strange concerning this fiery trial is to try you, so though some strange thing happened to you. Don't think it's strange, but instead, and, and would you just look down in your Bible and, and notice with me the second word in verse number 13. Preacher, how in the world do we respond to trials? Would you notice that second word with me? But rejoice. Peter, you must have falling out of a tree and bumped your head on every branch on the way down. Peter, you must for just a few moments have lost touch with the Holy Spirit as you were pinning this down to these believers. Something must have happened in the communication line between you and God. So Peter, you are telling me that in my trials, the proper response is for me to rejoice? Peter says, that's exactly right, rejoice. What does that word mean? It means be glad to whatever end and be exuberantly happy. Be glad. Rejoice. It's this kind of attitude that allowed Job to look towards heaven and say, The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's this attitude that allowed Paul to sit in the midst of a jail cell and say, I've learned how to have a lot, and I've learned how to have a little, but I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. It's an attitude not easily gained in the Christian life. Peter's first saying to us that we have to be willing to rejoice in our sufferings no no matter where they take us. We often quote Paul, don't we? Paul said, all Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
However, Paul wasn't speaking about competing in a sport. He wasn't talking about acing a test. Paul was actually saying, whatever my circumstances may be, I will still rejoice because I know that Christ lives inside of me and He is my strength and He's my sufficiency. Somebody would say, yeah, preacher, He's my strength, but is He your sufficiency? See, when I sit around on the couch and wring my hands about whether or not the coronavirus may come to my household with a little newborn baby in there, see, what I'm actually saying in my worry is that I'm not exactly sure that Christ is sufficient. When I find myself in the midst of a storm and I'm not sure up or down or side from side and I don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future of my life and all I can do is live in the midst of fear and anxiety and depression, what I'm actually saying, hear me out believer, is that Christ is not sufficient enough. Paul said, give me the greatest mansion in all the world or... Put me at the bottom of the lowest jail cell. He said, I'll still find a way to rejoice. We also as believers are called in the very same way to rejoice to whatever end. See, we're not called to be circumstantial workers or circumstantial worshipers. But we're to love God wherever we find ourselves. In whatever situation we find ourselves... Can I just say something to you this morning? I want to sit with love, and I don't want you to be offended when I say this, but the biggest problem with people in America, and I can't speak for all of the world, but I can speak for America because I live here, and I believe the biggest problem with Christians in America is we think God owes us something. We think that God actually owes a debt to us. We think that we deserve His goodness. We think that we deserve His blessings. We think that we deserve to be showered with all the things that He blesses us with. Can I, can I tell you something this morning on the authority of the Word of God? Every single thing that God has ever given you, is giving you right now, or will ever give you in your lifetime, is given to you by sheer grace. It is unmerited goodness. It is not earned or curried up by you. God is not rewarding you for your work. God is just simply being good to you because God is good. You could never earn it. So don't waste your time trying. You cannot explain it because it's unexplainable. God is good to us. Oftentimes, God is good to us in ways that we don't understand. Peter says we're called to rejoice to whatever end. Not circumstantially, but always. Not only are we supposed to rejoice to whatever end, but we're also supposed to be exuberantly happy in our rejoicing. <laughs> happy. It's not the word I think of, preacher, when I think about trials. I don't think about being happy. What were Paul and Silas doing in the midst of their suffering in Acts chapter 16? Well, they, they curled up in a jail cell there in the corner and they just licked their wounds and they said, Oh, you know, God, here we have gone out on this missionary journey for you and now you've thrown us in jail. I mean, come on, God. Look at all that we've done and this is how we get repaid? No, actually, the Bible says this about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, verse 25. The Bible says that at midnight... Paul and Silas were praying, and they were singing hymns to God. And Luke finds it necessary to add this into the book of Acts in chapter number 16, verse 25. He says that while they were praying and singing hymns to God, the prisoners were listening to them. See, James reminds us in his book in chapter 1, verse 2, that the trials we face ought to be met with happiness and rejoicing. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. So, so then we have to ask the question, I mean, why should we rejoice when trials come? 
Well, there's two reasons that Peter gives us in this passage of Scripture. Number one, the first reason that we rejoice is because we are partakers in Christ's sufferings. That word partakers uh, means to participate in or to be an associate of. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really kind of funny what Peter says here. He says, you know what? You ought to rejoice because you're a partaker of, of Christ's sufferings. Now, you know Christ suffered at the cross. We're almost here to Easter. And, and Peter says, you know what, believer? If Christ lets you do anything with him, you'll just be glad to be included. But, but preacher, I mean, I, I want to judge with him. I want to rule with him. I want to reign with him. I want to sit at the table with him. Peter says, it, if he just says, Blake, come on and suffer with me a little while, you'll just be thankful that Jesus Christ wants to do anything with you. That's what Peter says. He says, you're, you're a partaker of Christ's sufferings. We're reminded that if we want to experience all the wonders that come along with serving God, then we must also endure the difficulties that come along with serving God. He said, preacher, where do you get that from? Look at Romans 8, 17. He said, and if children, then heirs. He's talking to us there. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, notice something with me here. Peter calls him Christ's sufferings. And we all go through suffering. But Peter's specifically talking about suffering that comes for the name of Christ. The Bible makes no bones about it that those who sign up to be genuine Christians will face sufferings. Sometimes we suffer because we're airheaded. Wouldn't you agree with that? Sometimes I go through difficulties because of my own foolishness and stupidity. And that, make no mistake about it, when you put your hand to the plow and you really begin to serve God with everything that you have, you're going to lose some friends, you're going to lose some opportunities, you're going to lose some things that you otherwise would have obtained in this life. It's going to cost you something. Every person who is a genuine Christian will lose something in this life. The reason that shouldn't bother us is because we realize that we found the greatest thing that this life could ever give us. And that's a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only do we rejoice because we're partakers in Christ's sufferings, but we also rejoice because one day we're going to be part of the great revelation of the glory of God. See what he says there? That when his glory is revealed, the word glory there is speaking of that state of perfection and bliss that will come to those who one day ultimately and totally dwell with God. It's a reward for perseverance. God says, okay, you have been faithful to me, and now I'm going to let you in on a spectacular event. I'm going to let you be a part of something. Jesus says it's going to be like nothing the world has ever seen. It's going to be the revelation. The Greek word there is the apocalypsis, speaks of, of apocalyptic things, something that is still yet in the end. And it doesn't really mean like, what we've seen in the movies, apocalyptic things, it, it actually just means an uncovering, an unveiling, or a disclosure. If I understand this passage right, then I believe what Peter is telling us here is that one day God is going to reveal himself to this world in all of his glory and all of his power. And I believe it's going to be at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Spoken of in Revelation 19 and 20. Jesus Christ girts the great white, uh, leaves the throne and he gets on his white horse and he's followed by the believers who are also on white horses and we come back to this earth with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible says that every eye shall see him. Philippians 2 says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. The whole world will know who Jesus really is. 
Peter says, because you've been faithful, God's going to allow you to participate in the unveiling of the glory of His Son. He's asked us to be participants. So when you think about all that God has gotten prepared for you, it's really hard to get too focused on these trials. In fact, Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians. He says, these are momentary and light afflictions which are working for us a far greater weight of eternal glory. And then, and then thirdly this morning, let me give you this. There is the reality of trials. There is the response to trials. And then thirdly, there's the reminder in our trials. There's the reminder in trials. See that there's something for us to know and be reminded of in these trials that we face. What do we need to know, Peter? Well, first, know this, that if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. To be reproached means to be ridiculed, to be mocked at. Those people who do this are spoken of in Psalm 1 when he says, The blessed man does not stand in the way of sinners, doesn't sin at the seat of the scornful. Blessed are you if you're reproached. What, hap- what does it mean to be reproached? It means that we are reproached for the name of Christ, and in those reproaches we are blessed. James 5.11, he says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. Peter actually says here that when we go through trials, we ought to be blessed because it is a reminder to us that the Holy Spirit is actually living inside of us and God has His hand on us. It means God has searched you and He's found you worthy to be tested. See, Peter and John were at the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter number 5 and they were ridiculed, they were whipped, they were punished, and they were instructed to not again speak of the name of Jesus. And this is what they said in verse 41. It says, they departed from the presence of the council. And they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. See, here's the truth. Nothing tells you that you're a child of God more than when you walk through trials. Did your parents say something to you that my parents said to me? My mama used to whip me, and she would say, Oh, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And she would say, I'm doing this because I love you. Now that I look back, I realize she's telling the truth. She was actually instructing me and correcting me with a heavy hand because she wanted me to grow up and have the right kind of character, the right kind of maturity, And I realized, actually, that never did my mama love me more than when she corrected me. In fact, maybe she loved me more in those moments of correction than she even did when she brought me up close and said, I love you, because she loved me enough to beat the devil out of me. And do you know something? You are never more assured of your position in Christ And when God takes you through a storm, when God takes you through a trial, when God takes you through a moment of chastening and correction, He loves you enough to not leave you like you are, but to day by day conform you to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're reminded of something. When we feel like we cannot go any further, God is with us. And we believe the truth of Scripture that when we're at our weakest point, God is at His strongest through us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, He said to them, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, 
and distress us for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. See, God, God puts us through different kinds of testings. Let me just give you some, some, some ones real quick that we find in the Word of God. Sometimes God will put you through a testing that is disciplinary in nature. Go read the book of Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians. You'll find that God tested and corrected those Corinthian believers and He put them through trials because there was something inside of them that they needed to get out. They were beset by sin. So God put them through di disciplinary trials. Sometimes God gives us preventive trials or preventative trials. Now you say, where did that happen? Paul said that God gave him a thorn in his flesh. And the reason God gave him a thorn in his flesh is because he did not want Paul to be exalted in his own self to a place where he did not need to be. And so God gives him a thorn to keep him humble. See, sometimes God will put us through trials to keep us low. Sometimes God puts us through trials to teach us obedience. See, there's some things that I cannot learn in any other way than a trial. It's only in the storm that I can learn certain lessons of life. And then sometimes puts us through what I call a trial of testimony. Sometimes we walk through trials just to see how faithful God is to us. And when we come out on the other side, we can tell the world, God is faithful. When he said he would never leave us nor forsake us, I want to tell you something. You can say to the world, I have tested that and I have found it to be true. And you know the last reason why you always ought to rejoice in trials and trust God? Remember when I read you a few moments ago, Acts chapter 16? I said at midnight, Paul and Silas were not throwing a pity party, but they were praying and they were singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Foundations of the prison were shaken with an earthquake. Doors were opened, everyone's chains were loosed. Keeper of the prison came in. After he saw what had happened, he drew his sword. He was ready to kill himself. Paul said, do yourself no harm. Called for a light, came in there with Paul and Silas, and he asked him this question. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them home and fed them. The Bible says not only was the jailer saved, but all of his household was saved. Could it be that that entire family is in heaven today? Because Paul and Silas decided that it was appropriate, even in the midst of trials, not to mope and moan and groan and complain. But even in dark times and bad times, just praise God. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in America and across the world has an opportunity right now to praise God when it doesn't make a lot of sense to the world to praise Him. Saw a video just a few days ago of health care workers in, on top of the Cartersville Medical Center as cars packed the parking lot, prayed and worshipped God. Tonight they'll do the same thing at Floyd Hospital and Redmond Hospital. And untold thousands of lost people will see the church praising God in the midst of trials. And they'll say to themselves, what in the world would make people praise in a time like this? And we can boldly and unashamedly say, if you knew our God, you would understand 
while we can praise him, even in trials. And then you can say this, and you can know him. He died to make himself known to us. But he rose again. So that we might know him and spend eternity with him in heaven. Not even death can separate us from him. Because he's paid the ultimate price. We're going to have a time of invitation. I want to ask you there where you are. Maybe you're here this, maybe you're watching at home this morning and you are uh, tuning in with us and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. I want to encourage you this morning to understand the truth of the Bible, and that is this that Jesus Christ came to this earth, born of a virgin, lived a totally perfect and sinless life. Hung on a cross. Paid a debt that he did not owe. The debt was owed by you and by me. Gave his life as a ransom. And the third day he rose again. Victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And this is the invitation that is extended, I believe, to the entire world. Come. One word. As the Bible draws to its conclusion in Revelation chapter 22, one of the last things that are spoken, the Spirit... The bride say, come. Those who are thirsty, come. Drink from the fountain of life freely. Jesus said to the woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4, if you'll drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. How can I be saved, preacher? It's not nearly as much about what you say as about what you believe in your heart, but we communicate with our words. Maybe if you mean it in your heart, you would just pray something like this to the Lord this morning. Father in heaven, I admit that I'm a sinner. I have sinned and I have come short of your glory. I acknowledge that I cannot save myself. And I believe that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, died on the cross for my sins, and rose again on the third day. I believe this in my heart. And I desire to submit my life to His Lordship. I want to live not for my own purposes, not for my own will or ways, but I want to live my life to the glory of God. Lord Jesus, save me. I pray it in your name. Amen. If you prayed something like that and you meant it with your heart, and you truly want to give your life over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and you want to live in His will, not in your own, we would love to talk to you. Love to speak with you about what it means to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be a wonderful day to say you have been saved by the grace of God? Today is the day of salvation.